why don't we get started? Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted you're here with us today. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. And you've reached the concluding plenary session for the CNI Fall 2020 virtual member meeting, which has been running for about the past month or so. Um, this session concludes the two closing days of plenaries, and um, we conclude on a very happy and wonderful occasion. The Coalition for Networked Information awards a prize in memory of Paul Evan Peters. Paul was the first executive director, the founding executive director of the coalition. He um, was enormously um, uh, well-known, well-loved, um, a good friend and died suddenly in 1996. One of the things that CNI and its then parent organizations, the Association of Research Libraries, EDUCOM and CAUSE, the latter two more recently turning into EDUCAUSE, um, established an award in his memory and the key criteria for the award was really lasting major impact on scholarship, on the world of networked information, on the broader world. We give this award every year or two um, and um, the awardee is selected or um, nominated perhaps by the by an award committee. Um, this year's award committee um, consisted of, oh yes, just, just to flesh out, um, you can see how awful I am with slides, just to um, give you a sense of the kinds of folks um, who uh, have won the Paul Evan Peters Award. Uh, you can see here that our awardee today is in good company indeed. This year's award committee um, consisted of Christine Boardman from UCLA, herself a previous Paul Evan Peters Award winner, Herbert Von de Sample from Dance, um, who you heard from earlier in this meeting, another previous um, Paul Evan Peters Award winner, John Wilkin, the university librarian at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana, and Joan Lippincott, um, who served on the committee before she became Emerita Assistant Dir Associate Director for CNI. I'm very thankful to all of the folks on the selection committee for both their hard work, but also for making such a wonderful, wonderful choice. They have selected Francine Berman, um, who, uh, well, Chris will tell you a little bit more about her. Um, we are very lucky to have with us today, Christine Borgman, who, as I said, served on that selection committee and is a prior Paul Evan Peters award winner. Um, I will just say that I couldn't have been more pleased when they came forward with Fran as the selection. Um, and I speak for um, both John O'Brien, the CEO of Edge Cause, and uh, Mary Lee Kennedy, the executive director of um, ARL, 
um, in, in saying all three of us were just delighted and terribly enthusiastic. Um, Fran is an old friend and colleague. We've worked together on more things than uh, I can enumerate easily. Um, uh, she's done a tremendous amount for our community and for the broader cause of um, open science and uh, open data and uh, many other things. And uh, before we hear from Fran, who will give the customary um, uh, Paul Evan Peters award lecture, um, I've asked uh, Chris if she would be kind enough to just say a little bit about um, about Fran from the perspective of not just a friend and a colleague, but also a member of the selection committee. Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. It is indeed a great honor and a pleasure to introduce Fran, who is indeed a, a longtime friend and colleague. <laughs> I've also worked closely with her as has Cliff, probably first when we were together on the Board on Research Data Inf in Information and Co-Data of, uh, of the National Academies. Uh, Fran really exemplifies all of the criteria for the Paul Evan Peters Award. She's made major contribution to scholarly communication through her leadership as the founder of the Research Data Alliance, through her work uh, chairing Bertie with, uh, with Cliff, as he said, the Blue Ribbon Panel on Data Stewardship, uh, her service on the board of Sloan Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, a uh, Humanities Council, and uh, so on. So she's, you know, she's addressing the fundamental problems that we face in scholarly communication and technology, and she's greatly increased the awareness of these problems in a broader community. I think what's most important for this award is that she's taken this deep knowledge of computer science, having uh, directed the San Diego Supercomputer Center and then been vice president for research at, uh, at Rensselaer, in addition to all these awards for computer science, where she became a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery, the IEEE, the American Association for Advancement of Science, and so on and so forth. You can read all the rest of her wonderful uh, see online. Uh, but I think what's really exemplary is to say how she's taken that deep technological knowledge and used it more broadly. She finally got her first sabbatical last year because she just wouldn't let up on all this other work and went to Harvard as a Radcliffe Fellow to develop work on the Internet of Things. So we're looking forward to the book and the work that comes out of that. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, let us hear from Fran, the exemplary uh, new researcher recipient of this award and uh, she's given us so much and she'll give us more. Thank you, Fran. Welcome, Fran. Congratulations. I wish you could hear all of the virtual applause that's taking place. Over to you. Oh, thank you so, so much. Um, I'm still blown away by all of this. I have to tell you all, I, I'm so grateful to CNI and ARL and Educause um, for this extraordinarily meaningful award. Um, Chris and Cliff, who have been colleagues, fellow travelers, and inspirations for so many years, um, it's so meaningful to have, have you both uh, uh, speak and, and introduce me. Um, as we all know, any kind of impact takes a village, and there are so many uh, of you and so many people in the community who have been fellow travelers and so many of you who are doing so much now, I'll mention some of you in the talk, but I am so grateful for you know, what everyone is doing and the importance of it all. When Cliff uh, called me and told me about this uh, award, I was so surprised and I, I started thinking about what I might wanna say. Um, as we all know, we live in pretty extraordinary times and the pandemic has really exacerbated many of the things that we think about. And um, our community, the community who understand and care about data and, and digital technologies are more important than ever in this time. And we're important if we want to make society thrive and to get the best of the digital technologies and minimize their risks. So I thought I might talk about 
uh, the first 30 years of this century, um, what has gone before, um, what's ahead of us. And I thought I would start with now. So here we are. It's about 10 minutes after three Eastern Daylight Time, somewhere in the coronaverse. Uh, I'm wearing a dress, special occasion, but you wouldn't know it. Uh, I don't know if you're wearing shoes. We're meeting in cyberspace uh, via Zoom. And it's a really good time to start thinking about how much data is there? What are we doing with that? How did we get from Y2K at the beginning of this century to Cambridge Analytica and beyond? How did information technology become critical infrastructure? And what happens as we're seeing increasingly now, and we'll certainly be seeing over the next decade, when data is collected everywhere and algorithms are in charge? All really important questions that I think many of us think about all the time. And so uh, let's start with the first decade. We'll do this decade by decade. And you can kind of think about the first decade as uh, of the, this century as the almost famous data decade. And what I mean by that is data was driving everything, but it didn't have the kind of recognition and respect it has now. It wasn't a first class object. Um, it drove the presidential campaign, especially Obama's campaign in 2008. It wasn't the first time that data was used. Back in 1960, Kennedy used behavioral science and, and data to um, craft a message on civil rights. But it now is used for every campaign. Um, we all worried about Y2K. We all saw Facebook for the first time in that decade. We all saw iPhones for the first time in that decade. Um, Silicon Valley enjoyed incredible growth during that time, and it was driven by data, data which gave all of these companies a competitive advantage and became de rigueur for anyone who wants to do anything. Um, in medicine and health, we saw the Human Genome Project, again, all run by data, empowered by data. Um, in the supercomputing world, which I was very much a part of, there was the race to a petaflop. And we finally achieved within that decade petaflop computers. And where was I? I was at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. So I came on from my job as a professor at UCSD to lead one of the two NSF National Supercomputer Centers in 2001. Um, a little bit later on when the program changed, we had become a founding terror grid node. And our mission was really service to the National Science Foundation community and beyond. So we had thousands of users and it was really important for us to provide services and things they needed. When the Supercomputer Center was first started in the late 80s, it was modeled after um, the Department of Energy National Laboratories and their supercomputing facilities. But as Dan Atkins and others um, had said so compellingly, um, at the end of the 90s and the beginnings of 2000, cyber infrastructure was really the important thing for the research community as it moved on. And it wasn't just the computers, it was the software, it was the data, it was the portals. And so we set about kind of re-envisioning what SDSC was all about. And we had decided that in addition to providing, you know, high level supercomputers, what we wanted to do is provide a holistic data oriented environment for everyone. So the idea is that our vision evolved from data focused supercomputing and we had some wonderful people at the center, Chaitin Baru and Regan Moore and Phil Bourne and all kinds of people dealing with important data activities. But we really wanted to go beyond supercomputing and talk about cyber infrastructure. And we decided that we would remake SDSC to provide a much bigger and more capable environment for doing data focused work than, uh, than one would have at your local environment, your institution, your university, your research lab, et cetera. And, and we decided, what does that mean? We kind of want to stretch it out in all, all kinds of different ways so that maybe you could store a terabyte size collection, but we wanted to provide help in storing a, a petabyte size collection. Maybe you could keep several collections, but we wanted to create a large petabyte sized archive so that the number of collections could be stored um, uh, in a stable and reasonable way. Um, maybe you could store your collection 
um, for the life of your grant, but then you ran out of funding. So we wanted to provide some way to provide a greater time frame. Um, we wanted to provide a computing capability. And oftentimes when we chose machines, this was not all that popular, by the way, um, in a world that cared about whether you were at the, uh, on the top of the top 500 list. But we often traded flops for bytes when we thought about data-oriented simulation analysis and modeling. So that meant we tried to architect and, and create machines that had more cash, more memory, um, you know, a, a better environment for data. And the most important thing it turned out, as always, turns out to be the people and the tools that help. And so um, we really gathered people with expertise um, in data services, data software, curation, et cetera. And, um, and that, this was sort of the driving vision for um, SDSC and its uh, amazing uh, staff. What that meant is that we started creating and attracting all kinds of projects and new collaborators which really focused on data cyber infrastructure. And you know, we looked at data storage and data services and data visualization and data management and data preservation. And um, you know, you, SDSC had at any given time about a hundred projects or more, uh, a budget of tens of millions of dollars, typically between 50 and 80, hundreds of people. And all of those people were very involved in looking at data oriented activities. Um, one of the most exciting things for me and us at that point was a partnership that actually started in the office of the university librarian at UCSD, Brian Schottlander. And, um, and Brian is one of the people to whom I really feel like awoke such a passion in data and such interesting problems in uh, in the whole world of data stewardship and preservation. This is Brian's beautiful Geisel Library on the bottom and our old wonderful building, although it did have a view of the ocean. I just like to point that one out um, uh, uh, on the top. Brian and I worked together and one of our first conversations were about SRB and Regan Moore and the ways in which the library and SDSC were working together. But soon those conversations really expanded. They certainly expanded my own knowledge, but they also expanded our partnership. And one of the many things that Brian and, and I did together was something that I'm really proud of, which was um, a project called Chronopolis. And Chronopolis was a joint project between the UCSD Libraries, SDSC, and we had wonderful partners in NCAR and University of Maryland uh, originally as well. And the idea was to decouple access and preservation. So we built, we built a, a preservation data grid, which means that for all of the um, collections that we had, different nodes would play different roles. And so perhaps a collection we would make available to users at SDSC, but maybe NCAR University of Maryland would serve as a dark archive. And, and similarly, University of Maryland might be a bright archive for something, but maybe NCAR provided the dark archive. One of the things we learned in creating um, Chronopolis, and, and um, we are, we and, and I am so grateful to the Library of Congress and um, Laura Campbell and Martha Anderson for taking a chance on this and just providing such great support. Um, one of the things that was really interesting to me is that it really brought to, um, to the fore the importance of the social infrastructure one provides when you have these kinds of relationships. And so um, University of Maryland and NCAR and SDSC and UCSD libraries had relationships with each other, but we wanted to formalize them in some way. We wanted to formalize the trust and the, the backup and the replication we would have through service level agreements. And it really started uh, me thinking about the importance of the social infrastructure that has to pair with the technical infrastructure when you think about stewardship and uh, preservation of data. And it was very important for that project in particular. Um, it's a conversation that I carried on um, in the conversations I had with Chris Greer. Chris was uh, at the NSF at the time, and he and I were talking a lot about 
you know, how do you think about um, uh, preservation and access and stewardship in a way that creates kind of economic stability? Because in a sense, you're really thinking about data as a public good. And we all know that it's tremendously difficult oftentimes to sustain public goods. So um, we put together, um, Chris from his side at, um, at NSF and, and myself as part of the community with the amazing Brian Lavoie, who is co-chair with me um, of the Blue Ribbon Task Force for Sustainable Digital Preservation and Access. And the charge to that group was to build a comprehensive analysis of, you know, arguably the hardest part, the Achilles heel of sustainable digital preservation, which is economics. What's the economics of the data? How can we sustain it? What are best practices in that? How should we think about that? What should we uh, recommend for action? And we had um, a tremendously successful task force, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. And we had an amazing event uh, of which this picture is from of it. And you'll see many old favorites, including Cliff in a, in a mode that we often see him, thinking very, very deeply and then coming out with amazing insight. So, uh, so I was, uh, and you haven't changed a day, uh, Cliff. So this is pretty amazing. Um, the Blue Ribbon Task Force had a number of people on it and we uh, asked many people to testify and even more people for advice. And it, it, you know, in my opinion, it was a bunch of superstars. You'll see many names on there which are really um, recognizable and many names who have thought really seriously about the economics of data and data as a public good, including Lee Dirks, who we lost many, many years ago, who was such an important champion and contributor to our community. Um, Chris Greer started us off and Lucy Nowell and Sylvia Spangler and Phil Ogden, uh, Bogdan uh, kept us going. Um, Don Waters helped. Uh, the Library of Congress and NARA provided in-kind support for us, and it was a, an amazing uh, few years. Um, we were very excited to kind of look at all things economics, and of course, one of the things that we figured, uh, that we realized as we went through it, is there's really different environments in which um, data economics has to happen. And you know, one way to explain kind of what's going on is there are really many stakeholders in the data environment. There are those who benefit from the asset and those who select to what to preserve, those who own it or have rights to it, those who actually do the preservation and those who pay. Now, if you're Google, um, you benefit from collecting everybody's clicks. You decide which clicks you're gonna uh, collect. Uh, you own uh, it, and uh, so you're happy to pay the data bill for your own collection, which is your competitive advantage. And there is, there is great alignment between all of your stakeholder groups. And when there's great alignment, the economics somehow isn't a bad problem. But in, if you're in the research data world, which many of us are, um, the community often benefits from um, the data that we uh, generate or provide. We decide, the PI decides to select what to preserve. Um, perhaps our universities or others actually own the asset. And, uh, and uh, we or others may preserve the asset, but that may not go much longer than uh, the grant itself. And then the federal government pays. And that a lack of alignment makes things often very difficult to preserve um, collections of importance to the community. Um, our, our crack team on the task force, um, including a number of economists, looked at this from uh, four different scenarios, research data, as I've said, and um, uh, commercially owned cultural content, but they also looked at it from the point of view of publication and scholarly discourse and collectively uh, produced web content. Um, after a couple of amazing years with discussions that were extraordinary, um, the group came out with a couple of reports. Um, the amazing Amy Friedlander was um, editor for the interim report, and the amazing Abby Smith Rumsey was editor for um, the final report. Both of them are incredible documents, and um, I think now they're they're both on my website, and I believe they're both on Brian Lavoie's website as well. But um, at one point, they were on the SDSC website, and. Um, I have to say that SDSC told me 
that they had been, these reports had been downloaded more than 120,000 times. And so um, uh, we really felt like we had made an incredible impact with the Blue Ribbon Task Force. And I'm so grateful to Chris and, and all of the other people who were involved in it in any way. Um, of course, that's what we were doing. What was happening in the rest of the world uh, in the late 2000s, uh, data, the trickle of data that had started at the beginning became waves uh, and really a tsunami. Uh, everybody was talking about big data. Um, NSF had started asking people, so what are you gonna do with your data? And uh, the community was scourging, uh, uh, scurrying to create data management plans. Data was on the cover of a tremendous number of magazines. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider was spitting out petabytes of data, uh, many petabytes of data every year. And so really data had become a tsunami. And it really brought us into the next decade, which is you know everybody learning to surf the data tsunami. Um, that picture uh, in the middle is a common picture we see every day. We are all together, but we're all in our own digital worlds on our cell phones. Um, this, is the, the, um, this was the decade we saw Cambridge Analytica. People were using data for both good and for ill. And it was a tremendous time um, for data. Of course, there was also the recognition at that time that with more data comes the need for more and better infrastructure. And many things brought us to that. First of all, the rise of these small scale devices. So it wasn't just the big computers, it was computers of every shape and size, including ones that you put in your pocket. It was the um, sophistication of cloud infrastructure, which had really uh, started being a, a real thing. Um, the US government started deciding and, and recognizing the fact that stewardship and preservation were tremendously important. We saw the Holdren memo in the early uh, 2010s that talked about um, uh, you know, research data. We saw the government uh, putting out data with data.gov. We saw uh, an interesting uh, set of studies in nature which talked about all of the data that was missing because of insufficient infrastructure and stewardship and preservation. And so, um, so infrastructure was really because data had become a first class object infrastructure was on its way to becoming a first class object. And in that environment, and now we're going, uh, whoops, we need to go, there we go. And in that environment, we started thinking about, okay, what infrastructure? And, and this just gives you a sense about why it matters from the point of view of the research community. So no matter what kind of problem you want to solve, maybe you want to solve a public health problem. Who's at risk for asthma all over the world? Where are you safest? LA or Mexico City or you know, Arkansas or Malaysia? Um, you want to be putting together data from various um, places. You want to worry about interoperability. You want to worry about workflows. When you worry about how we increase agricultural productivity, you want to look at data of various crops and terrestrial data and weather data. When you worry about how accurate the standard model of physics are, you want to look at data from the Large Hadron Collider or what will happen in an earthquake. You want to look at seismic data and other kinds of things or data on um, building structures and, and how they'll withstand it. And what you need to solve those problems, which are really the focus of what you're, you're interested in looking at, is a whole bunch of data building blocks. You need uh, common metadata. So if I talk about length and Diane talks about length and uh, Diane's talking about centimeters and I'm talking about inches, we know we have a problem. And we need uh, domain and institutional repositories for that data. We need to understand um, what's legal and what's not. And that gets into some of the privacy things we start seeing um, as we go through this decade. What about data workflows? Again, sustainable economics, some of the most important social infrastructure data has. And so there's a number of different data building blocks one needs. And at least in the research environment, they're often a little ad hoc, often maybe a little one off because our market isn't quite big enough. And so um, that's a discussion that many of us had been having for a long time. And um, it's a discussion that Alan Blatecki and Chris Greer were having 
in their roles as working for federal R&D agencies with their colleagues around the world. So by that time, Chris was at NIST and Alan Blatecki, who had worked with me at uh, SDSC, was uh, at the National Science Foundation. And they had talk been talking with colleagues in Europe and Australia and Canada and all over the world about um, data infrastructure and how they could empower the community, not just the research community, but the community developing the building blocks that the researchers needed, the community of maintainers, the community of data infrastructure developers, et cetera. And so one of the things they came up with in those discussions is something called the Data Web Forum, and they wrote a concept paper. Now, by then I had repotted myself from the San Diego Supercomputer Center to RPI, where I was vice president for research. And um, because we were all friends, they kept sending me various versions of uh, the Data Web Forum concept paper. And I kept saying, well, what about this? And what about this? And by the time we were through with our conversations, by the way, um, CNI has this. Uh, CNI, I think, is the only place who has a copy of this concept paper. So thank you, Cliff. And, um, and if you're interested in it, you might uh, want to take a look. But by the time they were interested talking about it, um, I was very engaged with the concept myself. And I, I was very interested in um, the whole activity. And, um, and I missed my community because when you're vice president for research, you have to love all of your domains equally. And I missed being with the data community at the time when we were finally um, first class object. And so, um, so I uh, stepped down from being VPR and I uh, into my you know regular professorship, and I decided I would um, help out with this by helping co-found um, the Research Data Alliance, which is what the Data Web Forum we we renamed it. We decided this was a better name, and so on August 2012. Um, I was on the phone with several, seven other colleagues. Beth Flavey was um, a colleague um, from the United States and we, I had colleagues in, uh, from Finland and Germany and the UK and Australia. And, um, and by spring of the next year, spring of 2013, we had the first um, RDA plenary. 250 people showed up uh, from about 40 countries, I think. And, um, and grew to a community of over 11,000 today. It was, I have to tell you, it was thrilling getting to do, you know, essentially an international nonprofit startup and, and to do it when you really wanna focus on impact and outcomes. And so RDA started from those days to a community driven organization that was dedicated to the development and use of infrastructure for data sharing and data-driven exploration. And we got to you know, create our own culture. And so we tried to create a culture that um, would really enrich and elevate the data community. Um, our organization was very pragmatic. The idea was to solve targeted problems and make tangible progress. Um, we worked on problems that uh, somebody had, but everybody didn't have to have the same problem. And um, over time, our members uh, took kind of one of three roles, either a role as a member of an interest group, which were interested in framing the kind of infrastructure that was needed, um, a, a member of a working group, which was interested in building in roughly a year, year and a half, the kind of infrastructure that would be used by someone or an adopter as someone who actually used it. So all infrastructure, um, that's developed in the RDA needs to be used by someone and needs to be adopted and, and to make their life better. Um, the focus was always on impact and outcomes. Um, there was no build it and they will come. Uh, infrastructure was allowed and it had to solve problems. And it was very important for us to amplify the usefulness of that infrastructure through further adoption. And there's lots of programs on the RDA day, today that do that. Um, Maybe most important, I think, the role that RDA played is to help build a healthy and thriving data community. Um, one thing that I'm tremendously excited and proud of is that diversity has always been a priority in the RDA. It's perhaps the only organization I've ever been in uh, as a woman in tech, um, which has half women in leadership at all levels. 
And it's not just gender diversity, it's, it's diversity of professional age. We have a lot of early career people who are, who are in leadership. We have a lot of people from different countries. We have a lot of people from different professional uh, uh, places. And so RDA has really been a place where people mix and they mix in a, in a really useful way. Um, RDA has really elevated the recognition of infrastructure and the maintainers of infrastructure. We're really important people in our community and often don't get nearly enough uh, credit. And another thing I really loved about RDA is that um, there was not, no focus on world domination. The idea was to partner with other kinds of organizations, focus on enabling outcomes no matter where they came from and to really improve the community. And it was really thrilling to be with a group of very dedicated people who really made RDA uh, an amazing organization. Um, I borrowed this from the RDA website. They always have all kinds of handy dandy uh, statistics. This is pretty wonderful. It shows you the growth over time from you know, several hundred to over 11,000 people in over 140 uh, countries. Um, about a little bit more than two thirds of them are academics and researchers, but there's also a fair number in public administration, industry, journalism, et cetera. And we typically have you know, roughly a hundred minus uh, groups, interest groups, working groups, et cetera, working on, on stuff. You'll find the outputs there. There are outputs that are useful to librarians and outputs that are useful to researchers and outputs that are useful to um, uh, publishers and, and all of that kind of stuff. So um, it's just, a, it's a great organization. Um, because I'm a builder and I love building things, it was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful and exciting time. And um, I handed it over to, um, uh, to uh, we had a succession plan and uh, today Rebecca Cascella is leading RDA US and a really wonderful set of people are, are leading RDA from the international thing and um, the organization keeps going. And so I, I'm just so proud and supportive of what that whole community has done. Uh, while RDA was worrying about infrastructure, everybody else was too. And um, elsewhere in the 2010s, you saw a global recognition of the value of data for just about everything and the importance of infrastructure. Um, of course, it, it's, it's hard to find a company these days that doesn't try to use data as a competitive advantage. In academia, it was the rise of all kinds of really interesting programs uh, in data science and to ask some interesting questions about where do they live? Statistics, computer science, multidisciplinary, what do we teach in them? Uh, okay, we might teach machine learning. What about ethics and other kinds of things? And so um, we are still in a really interesting um, area or, or time of experimentation. And of course, the Sloan Foundation and the Moore Foundation has done a lot in terms of um, promoting and furthering the pedagogy in uh, data science. In the government, we saw data.gov, and especially during the Obama administration, and, and one expects during the Biden administration, we'll see a lot more focus on digital technologies, and I think that's going to be really important. But of course, none of those hold a candle to what we're seeing in our real lives. And um, they, uh, if you think about community and communication, social media, virtual reality, e-meetings, et cetera, we are awash in it, and especially during the pandemic. So that brings us to the next decade, which is uh, kind of the internet of everything. And uh, you know, we have smart cities, we have, if you had an avocado for lunch last week, it may have been grown on a smart farm where each of the plants have sensors that tell the farmer precisely how much water or nutrients or fertilizer it needs. Uh, maybe your car doesn't look like that, but, uh, it, but it's probably connected to the internet in one way or another. And so I thought I would talk about uh, this decade, uh, starting with where we are today in the coronavirus. So this is my cyber world, uh, circa 2020. Um, like the rest of you, I am uh, staying put, wearing my mask when I go out and uh, trying not to get uh, coronavirus. Um, I just finished teaching last week. This is my class. See, I tried to hide their names. So, you know, 
little privacy is not a bad thing. Uh, but this is how we taught all semester. We talked via Zoom. Uh, they turned in uh, digital assignments and I gave them digital corrections on them. Um, uh, you know, every time I got out in my car and I went hiking, I passed through an easy pass uh, thing. So my car uh, was uh, uh, tracked by the internet. I bought things, I buy things via uh, Amazon Prime. I got my groceries yesterday via Instacart. I entertain myself via Netflix. I'm on my uh, smartphone a million times a day. Um, those of you who know me well know that I'm a serious ballet student, which is not to say good. And this is how I take my several times a week ballet lessons. Uh, this is my teacher. My leg does not go this high. I just want to point that out. Um, but that's the screen that I see. And the screen that my teacher sees is the screen uh, behind her. And I am one of those boxes. I don't know if you can see me in this box. But, um, uh, but she corrects me over the internet from 3,000 miles away. And uh, my pirouettes have about gotten a little better over time. Uh, and I'm doing this in my living room. Now, that's my cyber world, but your cyber world might look different. Um, maybe you're driving a much fancier car than I am, which can drive itself sometimes and is certainly connected to the internet. Uh, maybe you have a much smarter home than I do. Maybe you use an Alexa or you have a connected uh, Roomba, which uh, vacuums uh, your house. Maybe you have a smart refrigerator or a smart toaster or other kinds of a smart coffee maker or something like that. Um, maybe you monitor your health via these connected devices. Maybe you have a Fitbit for when you run, or if you have a small one at home, you have a baby monitor and that's, and that's connected um, to the internet. So you can do all kinds of analysis with how they're sleeping. Maybe you have an uh, implantable pacemaker or an implantable connected uh, insulin pump. And of course, everywhere you go, you see these surveillance cameras. So you know, this is the cyber world we live in. And all of us, whether you take ballet lessons online or, or go through easy pass um, or drive a cool car, all of us are part of the internet of everything. And the interesting part of the internet of everything is that um, with all of these digital devices, which not that long ago were optional, um, with the pandemic, tech has become certainly if it wasn't before critical infrastructure. Um, I work uh, via the internet. Uh, my students go to school via the internet. Um, you know, the internet has become a critical part of just about everything we're, what we're do, that we're doing these days. And it's not going away. So if you look over the next decade, connected technologies are going to become more and more ubiquitous and unavoidable. Um, Cisco estimates that there are about 50 billion devices connected to the internet these days. That's more than six devices for every human on the planet. And that's pretty, pretty extraordinary. Um, the video surveillance market is in the billions. Uh, the economic impact of connected devices is in the trillions. Um, we expect all cars to be self-driving by 2050. We're just at the tip of the iceberg. And it's an extraordinary time we live in full of incredible opportunities and incredible risks. And so what does this mean for the data community? And it turns out that it's also going to be the generator of an incredible amounts of data. To navigate this brave new world, we'll need information on, um, to assess the, the um, objects and systems and devices that we have. Um, how do I know if I'm safe or secure? How do I know about the sustainability of these devices and systems? Um, we'll need a data on their operation. Um, we'll need to know, you know where that data should reside and who can access it. Um, we'll need data that helps us um, determine accountability and um, liability and responsibility and to determine ethical outcomes. And that data will, be, will come from the devices, but it will come from a lot of other places as well. We'll need data to, uh, to allow us to understand what's happening with these systems. So um, for them to be transparency. So what kind of information do we need? You know, take your average self-driving car. They're not completely self-driving yet, but many of them can drive in many instances all by themselves. Typically today's prototype self-driving cars are generating four to six terabytes daily. 
That's an, uh, uh, that's an immense amount of data. And, you know, as we try to understand, as we have them in fleets, as we have them connected to one another, they're going to be generating even more data. Now, for us in the research world, um, it creates all kinds of new and interesting research problems. So how do we do open science or make data fair or do reproducible uh, research in these dynamic environments? They're decentralized, they're heterogeneous. Um, the data is of different types, they're owned by different people. You know, how do we do any kind of work there? Um, for the many, many systems that are now uh, more and more autonomous in decision-making, how do we create representative training sets that don't get things wrong and, and put us in the wrong uh, space? How do we, we make sure that um, our decisions are more towards unbiased and ethical outcomes rather than biased uh, unethical outcomes? How do we architect the innovation tech, innovative technologies to promote the public interest? Facial recognition can be wonderful to keep us safe, and it can also be highly intrusive. And, and, and those are sort of social decisions, right? Facial recognition is just math. Biometrics is just math. So how do we decide you know, when it's appropriate to use them and when it's not? And of course, when all of this becomes critical infrastructure, a must have in order for us to be citizens of our society or students in our schools or workers in our company, um, you know, what extra rules are important? And none of this is easy button stuff, none of it. What we're finding, oops, what we're finding is that um, social constructs, social infrastructure is absolutely needed to promote the public interest. Without social infrastructure, you can go a little crazy. And, and we've seen, you know, people hacking baby monitors and screaming at babies. We've seen, you know, crashes of and catastrophic failures of self-driving cars and Alexas with bugs that shared information they shouldn't and cyber vulnerabilities and pacemakers and, and, and a whole national discussion on facial recognition. And what that means is that we really need to couple the technical with the social. We have this wonderful, wonderful capacity for innovation. We have to make sure that the innovation is good for us. And we do that by creating the correct kinds of social infrastructure that promotes the public interest, not private interest, primarily. Oops, I'm gonna go back now. Thank you. Um, and, so, and so one of the things for us to recognize, I think, especially in our community, is that social and policy controls have technical implications. And when we look at the public interest challenges, you know, which, which, which protection should we have? Privacy, safety, security, what does that mean? Um, when should public interest prevail and when should private interest prevail? Who should own or have rights to data? If you're the subject of the data, can you control what happens to it? Is that okay? Um, who creates the standards and the policy? And all of that at the end of the day really becomes, uh, needs to be translated into technical infrastructure, right? Access control policies, the way we collect metadata, the way we create the architectures of the services and devices we have. You know, when you go to Disneyland, if you wanna ride on the roller coaster and you're not tall enough, we already know it's not gonna be safe for you. We know that maybe you'll get thrown out by the seatbelt or you know the force of going around the corner. And so there's a sign and the sign says, you must be this tall to ride the roller coaster. And really what we need now is the equivalent of, you must be this tall to ride the internet of everything. We need to know, you know when is it possibly gonna hurt us? When is it possibly gonna help us? What can we do to make it safe and secure for us? So in the end, you know, it's all of our responsibility. And this is a decade that has just begun. It's a decade that we, this community, and all of the people that we work with um, can really make a difference. Government needs to take the lead in creating policy and legislation and enforcement mechanisms um, for personal protections for the public. That's what it means to be, to support the public interest. But business can then take those protections and design them in a really innovative way in terms of products and services. They can make those products and services more transparent. They can support safe practice. 
those of us in academia, it's really important for us to be training the next generation of leaders and the current generation of citizens. We need to be talking about the social implications of technology. Everybody in the world needs to know about if we're going to live in our time. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, you know, is 5G a good thing or a bad thing? Is net neutrality a good thing or a bad thing? Is data privacy a good thing or a bad thing? What cybersecurity? You know, these are things that affect the world that we live in, and it's really important for all of us not to know the guts of them necessarily, but to know what they are and why they're important. And of course, as, as citizens and members of the public, um, we need to also take control of what we're consuming. You know, we need to ask before we buy and sometimes make decisions not to buy things that aren't safe for us or that aren't private for us. We need to protect our data. And, and most importantly, we need to speak up and talk to uh, our people who can make uh, policy and legislation and provide feedback and votes. You know, if we looked at the primaries for the, um, this uh, unusual election we were just in, we had many, many, many candidates. And their attitudes about technology are important because the people who run our government can make rules about technology um, that make it easier or harder on the rest of it. So it's everybody's, everybody's responsibility. Um, so with that, I wanted to say a little bit more about all of the amazing people that I am so grateful to. And if I have missed anyone, uh, because I do have pandemic brain these days, um, uh, my great apologies. But I have to say that so many of you have been uh, so important to me, conversations, support, uh, partnership, uh, um, the great month that I spent with Chris at Harvard uh, a couple of years ago, um, the great partnership I've had with Cliff and so many others, um, it's really been so important to me. And so I thank you all and I cannot tell you uh, uh, how blown away I am uh, at receiving this award. Thank you so much. <laughs> Got to unmute if you're going to clap. <laughs> Thank you, Fran. That was just tremendous. Um, it, it really was. Um, and reminds us of so much that's happened um, over these first 20 years of the decade. Um, the look ahead is fascinating and scary. Uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really just kind of floored by the whole thing. Um, one, one issue that I'm, I'm kind of curious about, and I worry a lot about um, lately is resilience. Um, as as this as we become more and more dependent on all of this um, uh, all of this technical infrastructure as critical infrastructure, um, I th th there's a there's a tendency to want to optimize for cost uh, rather than necessarily optimizing for resilience. And um, I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, particularly in the context of, um, of the internet of everything. Um, that's a really great question. And I think um, it's a hard nut to crack um, because you know, the solution is shared by all of us, but the problem is also shared by all of us. You know, it isn't just the private sector being mean. Um, we don't wanna spend more for goods and services. Sure. And we want them to come to market as soon as possible. And so, you know, in some sense, there's no incentive for the private sector to spend the extra time making sure that there's security or, uh, or not to be taking data as uh, a competitive advantage because other people are, or to provide something that, um, that we are okay with. And, and that's why, you know, in my own mind, I think it's important that government take the lead. Because if government says, you know, you have to maintain certain standards. And if you think about it, um, although nothing works perfectly for sure, 
Um, if you think about food, you think about drugs, you think about our work environments, the government has set standards about what's acceptable and what's not. We have the FDA, we have OSHA, you know, we have a number of different government agencies whose job ostensibly is to keep us safe. If I, if I you know, have a, um, a building company, you know, it costs me more money to get asbestos remediation gear for my people. So why would I want to do that? But OSHA requires me to mm -hmm. do that because yes. asbestos, working with asbestos is really unsafe. You know, FDA has rules about food. Department of Agriculture has rules about food. And so, you know, why we wouldn't apply these same kinds of rules to cyberspace where things could be just as dangerous to us in a different way, um, it's not clear to me. And I do think we need to come to a time where they won't work perfectly, um, things will still be hackable, but we will be a lot safer um, if we kind of architect things so it gives us basic protections in cyberspace. And I think that's tremendously important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the sort of discussion about, you know, well, should we really have network connected devices with no provision for updating the software on it? Right. Like out there, um, we've seen well, that story. And another, another piece of that is, um, and I didn't talk about it in this talk because it was long <laughs> enough, but, uh, but, you know, there's a notion of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, if everything has a computer in it, and those computers are using rare earth or lithium batteries or all kinds of things, and then we throw them out, um, we have to worry about the kinds of materials that are being used and their depletion. Um, we have to worry about e-waste, which is mounting and not even counted by every country in the world. And so, you know, our success in cyberspace uh, may, you know, hasten the lack of sustainability of uh, the physical world yeah. and, and not just our social world. And so you really have to think about it in a very holistic way. And, uh, and I think that, you know, that's where, you know, you need adult supervision somewhere in the system. Yeah. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, not always, um, governments have played that role. Sure. Um, well, I have a couple questions coming in, um, but before I get to those two, I want to give Chris an opportunity in, to reflect for a moment on um, Fran's wonderful uh, talk. Sure. Thanks. And indeed, that was uh, that was wonderful, Fran. See, am I on yet? Let's see. Yeah, you're good. Good. Okay. Excellent. Um, I think that, you know, seeing that arc and seeing how much has evolved over this period of time. Uh, one of the things I was going to ask you to reflect a bit more on uh, something we're both concerned about is how the whole notion of open data has changed over the course of this time. You know, at the beginning of this period, open data was the, you know, the, the next best thing. It was going to revolutionize the world. And now we've seen all kinds of risks and challenges and problems and, uh, and uh, unexpected commercializations in other sectors and so on. If you could reflect a bit on how the notion of open data has evolved in terms of what should be open to whom and when and why with what restrictions over these several decades. I think that would uh, be a, a good conversation to move along to. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to respond to that, but I want to point out that uh, that as one of the world experts in things like that, um, I'd be interested <laughs> in hearing your thoughts as well, Chris. Um, I, I think the interesting thing to me about open data is, um, especially for us uh, in the research world, who have um, really leveraged open data in a really important way to make you know, important uh, breakthroughs, is that today, um, with data kind of awash everywhere and the private sector being a huge driver, you know, it's hard to know how the work we do in the research environment and the proprietary data um, that's generated by um, the private sector, how those can mesh in a reasonable way. So, you know, think about the jobs that both you and I have had, which is to train um, students who will go out in the world 
and do something important, either in the private sector or government or, or in academia. And um, when we think about the kinds of things we teach and the kinds of research they do, we want them to have environments that are similar to or representative of the environment they'll deal with in the world. And so, you know, and, and we want, and open data has been one way that we, we've been able to do that. But I think as we start looking at the problems that we're gonna increasingly see, um, when the private sector has so much data and right now so much of it is proprietary, um, I think we're gonna have problems even understanding the kinds of problems, certainly at scale, um, that a Google or an Amazon or an Apple or a Microsoft or any of these companies, a Pfizer uh, is gonna have. And, and so I kind of worry about uh, open data in terms of, uh, you know, what's going to be open under what circumstances is it going to be open? Um, how does it impinge on all the discussions we're having around privacy and, and all of those kinds of things? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, I, I think that evolution, that's a, that was such an interesting question, Chris. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you talk. You talked about um, uh, the some of the well-known issues around algorithmic bias, which actually is a term I hate because what it really is is you train something. Typically, what it is is you train something on data that was um, that reflected bias, um, uh, and you know the algorithm did exactly what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wonder in some ways whether we're not gonna see open data become a great source of bias in the sense that, well, if that's the training set you can get, that's the training set everybody will use. You know, if you look at, for example, some of the things that have gone wrong in facial recognition, part of the issue there has just been there have been these big training sets lying around that people use over and over again. Uh, right. So I, I, think, I think this is a pretty profound um, uh, set of questions you're raising there. Um, I wanna get, before we run out of time completely, um, I, I wanna get to two comments and questions that we got in here. The first is from Roger Schoenfeld. Um, who says, Fran, thanks so much for this wonderful talk. Congratulations. The world today doesn't just represent the shift of data and technology to being ubiquitous and critical, but also commercialized. Even if we think not about our consumer world, but about scholarship in key fields, for instance, in the social sciences, it's clear there's extraordinary value in data held by commercial organizations. You spoke about the importance of social infrastructure and balancing public and private interests. As data becomes more valuable, could you say a little bit more about the impact of commercialization of the data environment? And particularly in um, academia, perhaps, how is data commercialization affecting scholarship? And if we need to do something to course correct here. Uh, do you have thoughts on what we should be doing? Um, that's a fascinating question. And, you know, in a way, it brings up some of the questions, um, which Roger knows well, um, from the beginning of this, right? And at the beginning, when we started worrying about, well, um, uh, what if we publish the data with our publication? Remember those arguments from so many years ago? And because how else would you try to reproduce things or yep. understand what's going on? And um, today it's sort of uh, taken on a more mature, but you know, kind of equally difficult set of questions, which is, um, I think it always gets to the heart of, you know, what's the economic model that's gonna work? So if you commercialize things, um, you know, will that be a better economic model uh, or not. And, you know, what is the role of um, publications these days? And of, of course, you and, uh, and Chris and Roger probably have a much more sophisticated 
answer than I do, but I do think that it's really curious that um, we've given uh, time and effort to um, really thinking about these issues for many years, but it, in some ways we still don't have really a good answer to it all. And um, you know, if you if you look hard, you can often find sort of alternative ways and do an end run around publications, just like we used to do an end run around music companies using Napster, right? Um, but we still, I think, don't have, uh, and, and perhaps Roger knows uh, uh, a good solution to this, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know where commercialization should go with this. I don't know, what do you think, Cliff? What do you think, Chris? Um, you have a thought, Chris? Yes, I think it's a matter of, of governance, which is a lot of what data comes back to and certainly an issue that Bertie and, and uh, co-data and others have dealt with is whenever you've got something that looks like a common good and that is subject to free rider problems, which this it certainly is, uh, you've got to have some way of, of building a governance model. And that's where we've not gotten far enough in the economics and finding a good governance model uh, as these data run across the line of what's public, what's private. And, and I think that's one of the big barriers to researchers sharing their data is they're concerned about who's going to use those data to exploit them uh, for purposes that they did not see and uh, who's going to take the benefit from, from that down the line. So that's that's where the governance piece is part of what I was leading to with the open data question earlier. Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the areas I worry about as commercialization of data creeps into the, um, the scholarly publishing sphere, for example, is, um, behavioral data and what uses that can be put to. In other words, it's it, it, it's not so much the scholarly record itself, but the information about the interaction of perhaps specific individuals or groups of individuals with that scholarly record um, and how that can be monetized. Yeah, I mean, the economics of this are really odd in a way because People, things that are ostensibly free really aren't. Mm -hmm. And things yeah. that ostensibly um, cost don't always cost. Yeah. And, so, and so I think, you know, we have a very non-transparent and very confusing environment that's sometimes dangerous. What's, what's that old um, warning? Um, if the product's free, um, you're the product. You're the product, right, right. Um, let me move on to uh, another comment here um, and question. This is from Don Waters. Um, oh, Don. Fran, congratulations on receiving the award. Thanks for such a thoughtful talk. In light of the comments about public policy and economic goods, do you have any thoughts about the size and concentration of the big commercial data gatherers? Uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and friends, and the need for regulation of their activities, including the current antitrust activity. Uh, do you have a view on what kind of regulation is most urgently needed? Um, that's a great question because we're just, we're living that now as it plays out, aren't we? And um, I mean, when I, I look at that and I do think that, um, the way that the large scale companies kind of snuff out uh, smaller folks is not a good thing. And so um, I understand the whole focus on monopolization. It will be interesting to see in the next administration, you know, what the FTT and what the FCC and what all of the um, various players think about all of this. But um, I also think it's really important for us to understand that um, that doesn't necessarily mean that companies will be more protective. If you break up Facebook, it doesn't mean that, you know, if you have 100 companies instead of one company, it doesn't mean you're going to have more privacy. And so I do believe that we need to think about privacy and security and safety and other kinds of digital protections. Um, 
not just as part of an antitrust um, activity. I think we need to create um, uh, some bars where uh, we can expect that products and services will have uh, a certain level of cybersecurity. I think we can make rules about um, who can control data and when, uh, and we should know about when it's shared or exchanged with other people and we should know about what's being collected. I don't think GDPR straight out is gonna be something that will work in this country because we have a very different uh, culture. But I do think that we should be thinking seriously about our own version of what a GDPR would look like. And because I think that's really important for us to think about basic protections. That's not just, um, uh, it's not just a monopoly issue. It really is a protections issue. It is a public good issue. It's an issue about uh, when we can all prevail. Um, you know, if you go to a foreign country, which many of us are yearning to do at this point, because we'd like to travel anywhere, you never thought you'd hear yourself say that. Um, and you come back through customs, they ask you whether you've been on a farm, right? And to see if you're bringing various diseases into the country. Now, it may be that privately, I don't really want to share where I've been. You know, I don't want to say whether I've been on a farm or not. But I tell people whether I've been on a farm, it's the only way I can get in the country um, for the public good, because I don't want to be, you know, someone who um, brings in things that are, you know, bad for crops or whatever. And, you know, those are the kinds of, um, I think, you know, standards that we need to set that we, where we, um, you know, promote the public good as, as sort of a first class object. And so, so yes, I think um, the monopolies are really good things to be looking at because I do think sort of a thriving environment where people can be innovative with different ways of um, creating competitive advantage and different business models. You know, perhaps I'm willing to pay for more privacy than for my ostensibly free products. And so they shouldn't be crushed by the people giving me the ostensibly free products. But, um, but I don't think that's going to get us all the way there. Right. Well, I think Don, thanks you for that very helpful response. I think it's about time for me to once again congratulate Fran um, and thank her for a superbly thought provoking um, uh, Paul Evan Peters uh, memorial lecture. I thank Chris also. It's not often that you come to do one. Paul Evan Peters Award and get two Paul Evan Peters Award winners at the same time. Um, it's so good to see both of you. Um, I'd like to just take a moment to thank all of the uh, members who and guests who've been with us through this conference. Um, uh, I hope that you found the sessions useful. I hope that you find opportunities to enjoy some of the uh, pre-recorded sessions or recordings of some of the sessions you weren't able to get to um, synchronously. I thank the team at CNI for all their help making this happen so smoothly. Um, I feel a little bit weird to wish everybody a happy holidays in um, the COVID universe, as Fran puts it. Um, but I wish everybody safe times and better times ahead. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing you all in the near future. Thank you so much, Fran. Thanks for joining us today. And with that, I declare our full 2020 virtual meeting to be closed. Mm -hmm.